Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. Here's an update on my Starlink happiness level as of July 2021. Quick recap. I've had Starlink installed at my cottage in Ontario, Canada since March of 2021. Last month, I cut the umbilical on my landline backup system and have been swinging from a Starlink ever since. Spoiler alert, I'm still thrilled with Starlink. My download and upload speeds continue to be breathtaking, although my actual measurements show a slight deterioration from June to July. That said, it's hard to call an average download speed of nearly 100 megs a problem. I do see lots of variation from a minimum of 11 megs per second to this whopper, 342. Wow. By the way, the stats I'm reporting were collected over a variety of days, with temperature ranging from 20 Celsius to 30, well, one day of 32, with a fair bit of rain in July. Someone on a Canadian Starlink group mentioned seeing slower speeds recently and received this response from Starlink support. Basically a software change to address the high temperature shutdown issues that folks have seen in some areas. Now, if this is what's causing my slower speeds, I think they have further work to do to tweak that software. My temperatures have not been overly hot. Yeah, 32 was the highest in July. And honestly, my slowest speeds have been when it's been in the low 20s. Anyways, what about uploads? Upload speeds are also down a tiny bit, but still basically fantastic and an average of 14 meg. My highest upload speed this month was 40. Yeah, 40 megs per second up, crazy fast. The ping has stayed about the same on average in the low 40s and ranging from 30 to 65 milliseconds. So streaming videos and uploading stuff to my YouTube channel, it's all fantastic. So that's the good news. <laughs> what about dropouts and outage time? Dropouts are what I call the short one to five second outages I'm experiencing a fair bit. These have zero impact for most internet usage due to buffering, but can be disruptive in real-time communications like in a Zoom or Microsoft Teams call. Essentially, you'll be out of the conversation for a second or two, which can be frustrating at times, but I've never been completely discon disconnected from a call. We saw a tremendous improvement in dropouts from May to June, mostly because I was no longer getting these no satellite outages. Lots of satellites were launched and activated during this time, so thanks Elon, but I'm not seeing any further improvement in July. In fact, it's a bit worse than June. Both my obstruction outages, the green ones on this graph, and other outages, the orange ones, are worse than June, with dropouts about four times an hour, as opposed to three per hour in June. Now that said, May was seven and a half. By the way, the statistics monitoring system has combined all the stuff like beta outages and other stuff into this other category now. Basically, other is everything other than obstructions or outages due to no satellites. The Starlink team sent out a communication a few days ago saying that a promised software update had been rolled out, and this thing's called Best Satellite. Basically, with this software improvement, the dish will very quickly detect a loss of signal due to an obstruction, for example, and try to switch to another visible satellite. If this switchover is fast enough, and if there are visible satellites to switch to, this could virtually eliminate the impact of obstructions like trees. There's likely still a short downtime during this switchover, and that probably explains why I have more of these orange other outages now. So that's the dropout story. On the overall outage minutes per day front, July is a bit better than May, but not nearly as good as June. Again, outages due to no satellites has been completely eliminated. Yay! I can't report on any real impact on Microsoft Teams conference calls because, well, sorry, I've been on vacation or not working from the cottage. Last month, I did describe a workaround that works very nicely in Microsoft Teams where you split your call into a LTE-based audio call and a Starlink-based video and screen sharing call. This means if Starlink drops out 
at least you're still connected by audio. This works okay, but frankly it's a bit of a pain. Based on these statistics, I'll be continuing with this approach at least for a while. I'll let you know in my next update. What about actually eliminating my obstructions? Now I'm just ignoring the people who tell me to cut down my trees, but a lot of people say I should either raise my dish or move it. So I spent some time looking into what I could do. Here's an aerial view of my cottage site, looking more or less due south. Here's the current location of my dish, about 16 feet off the ground. You can see that there's a heavy concentration of trees roughly to the west of me. These guys are about 50 feet high. Then there's this massive pine roughly north of the dish. He's 75 feet tall. And another bunch of 50 foot trees to the east hiding behind the pine in the photo. And the obstruction map that is available on the mobile app corresponds very closely to this. Here are the west trees, the big pine, and the trees to the east. So I figured I'd do a little science experiment by comparing the obstacle checker results between the current location and up here near the peak of the roof. If I moved the dish up there, I'd be about five feet higher and a bit further away from the west trees. So I got out an extension ladder. Did I mention that I hate ladders? <laughs> and I did a mobile app obstruction check right from the top which is 21 feet up and again at the current spot. I really expected an improvement and was fully prepared to move the dish. However, as you can see in this series of side-by-side -side comparisons, there's not that much of an improvement. It basically just moves my obstruction problem around. Definitely better on the west side, but at the higher location the pine to the north becomes a bigger problem. And suddenly these guys to the east start getting in the way as well. So overall, I'm guessing I would see a small improvement on what is already a small problem. So in my opinion, it's not worth the hassle and risk of moving the dish. Maybe I could install a giant tower and mount the dish up there, but that sounds like a lot of expense again for not that much improvement, not to mention the eyesore. So for now at least, we're going to live with the current mounting location and see how things improve as the satellite constellation further fleshes out. The first shell of 1500 satellites is apparently nearly complete and satellites for a second shell are now being launched starting in August. So bottom line, I'm really happy with the speed an overall performance of the Starlink system so far, and I expect the dropout problem to reduce to a negligible level over time. And even the dropouts that we're having now aren't really that big a deal. And before you say it, I know we're in beta, and that's why I'm actually capturing and sharing some quantitative information about how the system is working. And it's, this is how it's working for me. That's what a beta test is all about. Well, that's all for now. Hope you found this video informative and helpful. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this, and ring that bell for notification of all my videos. Thanks for watching.